Welcome back. Thank you, Frank, hanging out with us once again. This is the one and only IT in the D Show, episode 441. I am your host, Bob Waltonspiel, hanging out with my co-host, producer extraordinaire, Randy Walker. Guest this week, Dennis Weiss. You might know him from that little distilling company down in Clawson Weiss Distilling, but he has got a phenomenal IT background, owning uh, IPQualityScore.com, IPQS.com, also Sabbath Coffee Roasters, where he's implemented technology in ways uh, I didn't know was possible. So we'll be talking about that. You can find us online, ITInTheD.com. Do us a favor, give us a like on the socials, subscribe to us everywhere. Fine podcasts are sold. Don't forget, meetup.com slash ITInTheD. This Thursday, the 21st, we are going to be at Nancy Whiskey's, probably in the patio of weather permitting. Uh, no cover, no speakers, just uh, some IT folks having uh, cheap beer and some telemerdew. And that is today, if you're listening when I publish the episode. <laughs> That's today, right. You go out, record Monday, go out Thursday. You know, you're good about that. So, yeah, t- it'll be tonight. One night only. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, how you, how you doing? How they treating you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, guys. Looking forward to chatting tonight. So I'm going to go with what I know, and I'm going to kick things off with Weiss Distilling. Um, I think you just did every like nerd and geek's dream as you actually like, ma- you know, you, brew- you made booze and you're yeah. selling booze, <laughs> and uh, it's a beautiful world. How did you? Uh, was this always a lifelong hobby, or how did you? Uh, how did you get up, end up founding uh, Weiss Distilling? Yeah, so I guess it kind of all comes back to being in the IT space. So one of my strongest points as being the CEO of IPQS is finding a team that can make things work. Um, and that's kind of how the distillery came to be as well. So I do have family in Europe that used to make stills. Uh, they made their own spirits. They aged their own wines. Um, so it's kind of been in my blood since I was a young kid. Not not literally, but, you know, it's been in my blood where I saw my family, you know, drinking wine and spirits and all that. Um, but, yeah. I mean, it's kind of been always there and interesting to me, but I took my technology background and kind of brought it to distilling. So uh, if you guys know anything about our distiller, we do use an ice still and we do use like newer technology things. Um, so it's really exciting to kind of bring that space, you know, into here. So, so I do have to, I do have to rant really quick when my, uh, when my grandfather passed away, both in Chicago and here, they both had amazing copper stills in the basement. Yep. And uh my it, it my both times my uh, dad wanted to take them home and my mother made him scrap them so there go there went my uh my dream of running an illegal booze shop out of my basement like my grandfather's both did. <laughs> so uh, there's some studies that recently came out they said like if you have a glass of wine a day a, a glass of beer a day uh, it's actually good for your health uh, but then when you looked at spirits it actually could be bad for your health and uh, looking more into study I, I talked to the i still guy he loves like researching the science behind everything and he found out that we're using too much copper so like a thousand years ago when they used to distill they would use copper to like get all the bad stuff out but nowadays with technology Technology. I mean, we have, you know, RO water, we have really clean ingredients where that's not as important anymore. We do still use a little bit copper, but, you know, again, going back to science kind of helps us like improve how it's being made and how it's being distilled. And, you know, we try to use organic ingredients when we can, everything local that we can, so we can get a better product. I'm not going to lie, the charcuterie board you guys had or the, the little box thing yeah. was probably the best charcuterie I've ever had, like in terms of like just the, you know, what was put in it and the, you know, the quantity and the quality. It was a uh, absolutely phenomenal. I think the bartenders hate me, though, because I do dealer's choice tiki drinks in the big tiki. I have to have one of the big tiki mugs. I can't have like little small tulips. Randy can have those. Uh, I can't. I'm like, you got to give me the big tiki, tiki glass and they, they 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 accommodate. Yeah, um, they'll do anything like that. Anything with fire. I, I love fire, but that's always off menu. So just ask for some more flames next time. No, that she lights the thing on fire, whatever the stick in the in the drink. Yeah, she does that. Yeah, the whole night. Cinnamon. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Rima likes going wild with those. Yeah, she she's great. So I mean, in terms of technology, and what are you doing? What what else are you implementing in terms of like? Are you getting into like? crazy analytics i mean are you in terms of the testing i I guess talk to talk to me through that yeah so we kind of do that both sabbath and the distillery so we bought a roaster uh from turkey and then we kind of just took it and made it into our own 
I mean, we call it our Frankenstein, but we put our own gauges on it so we can like temperature control everything. And, you know, just getting back to more science and then like trying to look at the analytics, like when we should, you know, turn the flame down or up and it's just all perfect. And the same thing with the stills. So usually a distiller will go and hand taste spirits as they come out and that's how they make their cuts. So when you're distilling, you get head, heart and uh, tail cuts. But with the system that we use, uh, we have a little robot built in that actually tells us, hey, here's your head cut, here's your heart cuts, here's your tail cuts. And then from there, like we have a perfect uh, product every single time. So that first time when we nail it, we'll never mess it up after that. It's kind of like we can set and forget it, but obviously we have our eye on it the whole time. So. Yeah, we had Rafino Valentine on way back when, and he hand tasted it. I'm yeah. like, that, it must make for long nights if you're. <laughs> if you're... <laughs> hey, that, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's great. But I feel personally, if I taste the same thing over and over, like sometimes my palate can get a little messed up. So if I can use technology to make me, you know, have a perfect cut, I'm not going to step away from that. So when does it, I'm just curious when the robot, when does it say it's good? So it's really based on temperatures. So precisely when it hits the temperatures that we need, depending on the spirit, that's when we know when our cuts have to be made. And then obviously we hand taste it as well to confirm that. But I mean, the next time we do that, we know what range we need to be in. And again, technology helps us do that. Right, right. So I could talk about booze all night. Randy knows this, but uh, you know, we're you know, this is an IT show, so let's let's uh, break into kind of the the, the IP quality score, the IPQS.com. Um, I guess talk to me about how you got into that and and what it is, because this is kind of unique in terms of the things that in terms of fraud p- uh, prevention tools, something that. I'm not used to seeing around every day. So I'm just, I'm totally curious as to what you guys are doing and how you founded it. Yeah. So 10 years ago, I actually started an advertising network. Uh, I was doing a lot of media buying, a lot of, you know, putting ads in spaces that I thought were good spots. Uh, but with that, I was getting a lot of, you know, poor quality leads, uh, bad lead generation, bad information. So I kind of had to look at it like, hey, What's going on here? And there really wasn't a tool out there that could help me like filter my traffic and make sure that it's good quality. Uh, so again, I built internal tools to kind of detect that. I look at the IP addresses. I look at the email information, phone number information, any kind of lead, da- lead gen data that came from there. Specifically at that time, we were looking at the IP addresses. Um, our quality of traffic skyrocketed skyrocketed and our advertisers like hey how do you have such good quality traffic no one has like this quality traffic so we told them you know we built an internal system um and then they were like hey can we lease this from you can we use your system so uh, about three years ago it turned into like our own SaaS, and that's kind of what ipqs is today so uh we do ip reputation looking at ip IP addresses, we do phone validation, email validation. Uh, we also do device fingerprinting. So if a malicious user is uh, going in and changing their device or spoofing their information, like we can pick up on that. Um, and it's a pretty solid system. You know, we have a lot of competitors out there. A lot of them will just focus on one tool, like being an email validation company or a phone validation company. Uh, and I hate when people are jack of all trades. So IPQS is a jack of all trades, but you have to be a jack of all trades when you're fighting fraud. Because if you think about it, all our competitors are basically like the outside layer of an onion. As opposed to us having all these tools, we're like cutting the onion in half, having every layer, and our algorithms just get way stronger. Um, so that so I wouldn't really- consider you. I wouldn't consider you a jack of all trades because then you'd be doing firewalls, then you'd be doing antivirus, then you'd be doing. You know what I mean? Yep. I think you're, you're pretty. You're still pretty. Um, focus it's funny though your um how you got founded we had the ceo of f5 networks on a long time ago and his in load balancing was birthed out of his he was selling stock what are those called randy the uh the stock trading boxes that they sell to like the chicago mercantile exchange you know the big big huge trading boxes this is like in the late 80s and he uh, opened up a market in hawaii started an isp the first isp in hawaii so he could you know, basically get IP connectivity to those Mm -hmm. and they weren't fast enough. So he invented load balancing as an afterthought so he could get faster boxes in Hawaii. So pretty, you know, as soon as you started talking, I'm like, Oh, it's funny how, you know, companies get birthed out of uh, inventing things for their own, uh, for their own, you know, own internal uses. 
Yeah. I really think experience is like the biggest push for anything. Cause you know, if there's a need, someone will go and build it out and you don't get there without, you know, experiencing fraud. So the fact that we're an anti-fraud company, it's really, you know, really helpful. And you did mention like antivirus stuff and whatnot. So we were the first ones to discover residential proxies. So, you know, VPNs, proxies nowadays, like people associate that with being anonymous. And a lot of the times people think that it's like fraudulent traffic. And that's just not the not the case you know people just want to be anonymous in the world today um, but what we did discover is residential proxies so what's happening now is uh, there's actually companies out there that will pay you for your bandwidth and use your IP address and it looks like a clean connection coming from Comcast or wow or something of that nature but really it's so malicious using it so we've infiltrated like all those providers uh, we have our we have connections that you know tell us which IPs are being used maliciously. Uh, we're always on the dark web finding new and leaked data. And then we're one of the only ones that has our own honeypot system. So basically, we're setting bait out in the inter internet and we're collecting data that way and finding like transactions that should have never happened, uh, you know, collecting information that way. So it, it makes us very powerful. And uh, we have a lot of good data coming in from those streams. I'm surprised a lot of the bigger e-commerce companies and I'm, I'm assuming e-commerce so those are the majority of your customers or or is it kind of spread out it's spread out i mean since we were in the advertising space it was a lot of advertisers that came on board but you know we work with crypto exchanges financial financial institutions e-commerce as well social media companies use us to detect bots now do they take that information and use it no but right. social media yeah social medias do use our technology so um, yeah, no, I mean, my point was uh, I'm surprised and kind of shocked how some of the bigger like I just got hit with fraud from Walmart mm -hmm. and the idiot used my email address, but not my account and purchased a bunch of garbage and sent it to Louisiana. Right. Yep. But like I kept getting the notification. So I kept calling Walmart, you know what I mean? And saying like, this isn't mine, you know, cancel it. And I was calling the, all, all the carriers. But it's just to me, it's it's kind of shocking to me that some of these bigger companies don't have some sort of a a two factor. It's just, it's really simple, just to like, you know, Amazon for example. If somebody knows my password; they can just buy whatever and send it wherever. Right. Because if you look at you know look at my addresses on Amazon, I don't know about you, but I think I have like fifty of them. You know, things I forgot and I ship it to a hotel or yeah, <laughs> you know, sending stuff to relatives. You know, it just it it just shocks me how like you know if somebody just can hack into my stuff, send anything anywhere. It's just, I'm surprised not more people are doing anything a little bit second level. Yeah. All. And the problem with that is, uh, you know, they hire huge departments of fraud and it's all like, they're trying to look at it eye by eye, but that doesn't really work. You need a tool like IPQS that can be there 24 seven scoring the transactions in real time and then alerting, you know, customer service. Hey, you know, this looks suspicious. Maybe you should do, do a, you know, two factor, do something else, reach out to the customer and, and whatnot. But like a tool like ours, like gives you all that data to start with and stuff. Um, my, uh, my thing, what have, if, if, if I've been arguing about anything for the past 10 years, I don't understand why banks or Visa or MasterCard doesn't or American Express doesn't utilize this. When you buy something that you get a pop up notification or some sort of two factor to your phone. Are you making this purchase? Are you spending eight hundred and twenty dollars in gas right now at Meyer? Um, yeah. You know what I mean? They just you know, they just leave it up to post fraud, which is I think the most of the departments are just handling post. They're exactly. not doing anything pre preventative. I can't imagine that it would be that difficult to implement something like that. It, to, as an opt-in um, oh, and i don't get i don't know why i think capital one does it if it's over a certain limit or something but that's about it yeah and it's kind of how they set up those filters too because like i mean I, i've had issues where my bank will like shut down my card because i was traveling like they don't really know how to set their filters too so we have like a whole section where you can preset your filters and whatnot and then you can modify it you know seeing what kind of traffic you're getting or what kind of clients you have but it's crazy there's a, a cryptocurrency exchange that we're working with and they just launched like their own debit card rewards card and this company is a billion dollar company and guess how many people are in their fraud division that manages this card? It's either going to be like three or it's going to be 3,000. It's one. <laughs> so one person is the is responsible for detecting all of the fraud transaction going through it. And that's a billion dollar company. So uh, that, that kind of leads me on to saying why our competitors, I think, are missing out on fraud too. Because 
companies. So I still funded my companies, my first one, and then we did really well there. So I still funded like IPQS. And I think what happens is our space is a lot of anti-fraud companies will th- think of a tool or create a way to catch fraud. They'll raise a seed round and then they're kind of tied to keep raising raising money. And, you know, that's not how we do things. Like I'm focused on the tools, fighting fraud, and the sales come after the fact. So, you know, we don't have a big sales team, but our product is huge word of mouth. I mean, I'll get calls from Fortune 100s just being like, hey, you know, we heard about you from one of our competitors or one of our friends, friends in another fraud department. You know, we'd love a demo to see what you guys can do. So. Yeah, so I'm looking through your website right now. I'm looking like click fraud protection and prevent affiliate fraud. And I'm just like, I'm curious. I don't know if you want to go one by one, but I'm just, uh, you know, I didn't even know there was affiliate fraud. I guess you, people driving fake clicks to, you know, so they get their, uh, you yeah, know, they'll get, get their friends trying to sign up or they'll use bots and whatnot uh, to like sign up for something. So like that's the affiliate fraud. And when I say advertising, I was also in that affiliate space as well. So there's a ton of fraud there. I mean, you can go on like forums online and tell a hundred people to sign up for your product or your referral link or something like that. And you know, those aren't going to be quality users and stuff. So. Yeah. And like the fake and duplicate accounts, like it, that's like half of Twitter and half of Reddit, right? What are you, <laughs> or, yep. are you just cross checking it with an IP address or what? I'm not going to, you know, you don't have to tell me how the sausage is made, but what do you, what are you, uh, what are you trying to accomplish doing that? Yeah. So when someone signs up, we're looking at everything. Like how active is that email address? How is the uh, phone number related to it? Have we ever seen a crossover from both? We're just looking at so many different data points. I mean, on our email validation alone, we give you like 23 data points back on the API. So like you'll know so much information just by putting an email address, just by putting a phone number in, just by putting uh, an IP address in. Like we put all this historical data and then also new data that we're getting from like our honeypots and whatnot as well. I hate to ask a stupid question, but who else is doing this? Because I don't like I've been in and around data center and security for the majority of my career. And I know people have done certain things. More of it's on the corporate level. This seems like this is getting a lot more detailed. Is this, you know, I don't think, do you have a big uh, like competitor base or is this, you know, did you pretty much make up this industry as you, as you went? There's definitely competitors and sp- sp- excuse me, specific parts, right? So like the email validation or phone validation. I mean, there's threat metrics out there. That's one of the biggest players in the space. And we compete that compete with them on a daily base. Um, interesting fact about that is we have a free version that a lot of people will use. And we can see the ISPs that are connecting. And a lot of our competitors are trying to use our free plans. Uh, big companies like Apple use our free plan. And it's just like their fraud teams are just like using our free lookups and whatnot not. Um, I was at a conference in Vegas uh, a couple months ago and I had someone come up to me and he's like, Hey, you solved our chargeback issues. I was like, Oh yeah. Tell me, you know, what plan are you on? Give me some more info. And he's like, Hey, I'm on your free plan. And you took my chargebacks from 30% to 5%. And I was like, Hey, if you ever want to get down to one or 0%, you know, you please pay for a plan. <laughs> but so I'm a complete idiot chargebacks. I know what it is, but like, are they just disputing like they're getting a service and then disputing it the next day? Uh, so that's like friendly fraud. So if it's like an actual person that's like actually got the product and everything, they'll do a chargeback. Uh, other chargebacks that can happen are just like high risk transactions where like the bank will like do a chargeback or something. But like our tools will give you a fraud score and tell you potentially if this could be a chargeback. Like we've seen this credit card having a lot of chargebacks or, hey, this address seems to have a lot of chargebacks. Like we, we look at all that information. We share that with you and give you a fraud score in real time. No, it's like, it's funny. You think it's hard enough getting through a normal day doing normal things. Then you have people like (laughs) doing stuff. I was seeing a YouTube video where like people, I guess when you're in Uber, you can cancel mid ride and then you don't get charged for it. Like, Hey, why would Uber allow that? And B it's such a widespread thing. People are making videos for it now. Um, Yeah. I mean, they were one of our our first cup customers because they were giving out free rides and people would just make fake email or they would use disposable emails and just keep making new accounts. And they had no protection in that. But yet, you know, they had thousands of employees. I mean, it it goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's like they have these huge departments to fight fraud, but they don't have the tools in place. Like, I mean, think of you or I or Randy, like trying to catch fraud. Like it's going to take up all of our time just hunting down one fraudster, you know? 
Oh, all day. I mean, as I was in the uh, machine learning sim space, mm -hmm. and it did what 10 to 15 sock analysts could do by just looking for weird, right? Yep. And that's like the, the common thing now is people like, you know, baseline normal looking for weird is kind of the the standard when you're looking at all of this stuff. Is is that what you're is that kind of what you're doing is is baselining a normal looking for anything odd or is this like or is it more of like a red flag thing because of because it hit these three checkboxes? Yeah, so it's more of already knowing that there's something suspicious, uh, excuse me, suspicious going on. Um, I mean, we'll also look for the weird. It's like a whole big setup that we have. Like, I guess I could, I would say that we look at it all. We look for weird. We look for red flags that we already know are true, and then based on all that, we give you a fraud score. Okay. No, yeah, because I've heard of the the, the scoring things. Our uh, Caston Thomas has been on the show a few times. He does it for enterprise as a holistic security thing where they're, where they're actually, you know, scoring it almost like a health score in a New York restaurant, right? Where mm -hmm. like, Hey, we're a, you know, we're an A, we're a B, right? Um, so, Hey, moving. Uh, so you mentioned it earlier, Sabbath coffee roasters. I'm uh, just saying the whole name now. And you were talking about um, some of the technology you implemented there. And I'm uh, fascinated with like new, like, newer retail and the technology that goes into some of these things i saw the new amazon store and i don't know if you've saw it yet it's the it's the amazon style it's in california and the technology they have implemented is absolutely mind-blowing with the dressing rooms and the qr codes and um they know who you are they, they they're, they're assuming what you might like um and then you go in the dressing room if you need a bigger size like there's like a magic closet where someone will like swap it out from the back side of the closet it's awesome if you ever see a video for it yeah. um what are you doing for technology wise at the, at the coffee shop yeah so i mean we have our own plugins that we've put in so i mean using these same tools at ipqs just in plugin plugin forum on shopify uh so just looking at like every transaction that comes in when people order uh bags of coffee to ship out and you know we'll, we'll put the algorithm in there and then we'll kind of spit out a fraud score and then we'll see like hey is this a high risk transaction or is it not so are you now are you declining purchases if they're uh not hitting a threshold or yeah so we don't so it depends on your business right so if we had millions of transactions a month yeah maybe we would we would do that but you know we're still a smaller company uh definitely growing fast and getting a bigger reach more nationally um but like we're still looking at those and kind of you know, if we get a high fraud score we'll try to call the number reach out uh we'll do some manual stuff still there so Please tell me it was named after Black Sabbath. <laughs> it was not. <laughs> no, boo. I'll still uh, I'll still look you up online. I'll still buy some coffee. Um, so what did uh, you were mentioning when we were talking before the show about um, the FBI showing up when you started hiring employees? Um, talk <laughs> what's up? You didn't get swatted, did you? No, not at all. So what happened is, uh, you know, I love to use Reddit, Upwork, all these like online sources, try to connect with different developers. I probably tested out maybe over a thousand developers uh, to see who's like a good programmer and whatnot. Uh, one of these guys that we hired actually was XNSA. Uh, and the, the first week that we hired him, we moved him to a different state because he wanted a lower cost of living than in Washington um, and, or DC. And then, uh, you know, got a knock at the door, no phone call, just showed up. And they basically asked me, hey, why did you hire this guy? Why did you give him a bonus? And that was kind of the entire extent of it. The fact that they would even – are they doing that now? Are they following these guys around for the rest of their career? Is that – I like, mean, my my team used to work with Edward Snowden. So, I mean, you saw what happened there. So, you know, I guess they just want to make sure nothing else was happening and, you know, make sure there's no traitors or, you know, terrorism or anything crazy. Snowden still in uh, Russia or what was – I forget. Uh, like, yeah, he's a, there. Is he still – jeez, that's, that's insane – and if you look at what he did, like, you know, th there's arguments on both sides, right? That he was a domestic hero and he's also a, you know, terrorist. It's yeah. funny how you can, you know, you can play in that little gray space. And ah, it's crazy that he's still in, uh, still in or the, the Russia that we know of, right? Right. He could be on an island. Who knows? Um, yeah. I'm all about transparency. So that's important to me. But obviously, some secrets need to be kept secrets as well. So, 
No, I agree. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm on the fence with both. Yeah, I, I see both sides. I'm kind of like, exactly. kind of like politics with me. Like, I see your side and I see your side, and I can understand why you're fighting. Um, <laughs> so, how do you stay at what's next in, on the IPQS side? What, or how are you staying ahead of trends and, you know, looking at to, like what's on the horizon? Because obviously, you need to change every day. Otherwise, you're, you're stagnant and you're dead. Um, what are you doing to stay ahead of the curve or, or just to find out new stuff going on? Yeah, definitely listening to the customers. Uh, if they've ever experienced anything interesting or new, we go and like investigate that. Uh, recently, we kind of discovered shipping uh, proxy. So have you ever heard of what happens there? Uh, no. So basically, someone will contact you or they'll have a job opening and you'll sign up and they'll say, hey, we're going to ship you this product. Uh, we don't want you to open it, but we'll give you $500 and then you ship it to the next person. Uh, and basically, they're doing this a lot with like um, retirement homes and stuff and offering them to make more money. Uh, but basically, a fraudster will you know, get in a credit card. Uh, number buy a product send it to someone else's house and then from there <laughs> excuse me they'll ship it to someone else's house and then it'll ship somewhere else and at some point the fraudsters will pick up the product uh, either from the porch or from like a p.o box and it's almost impossible to backtrace all of that so there's always new things and trends that come out um and wouldn't, it be one, easier for them, wouldn't it be easier for them just to work for it i'm just like again some of the stuff just absolutely blows my mind Hey, I, I agree with you. I say the same thing all the time, but sometimes it's easier to sit at a computer and just make a whole web and just, you know, hide behind all of that stuff and do it that way, I guess. But well, yeah. I was shocked. I was shocked on how like the people will drive to the gas station and get like a thousand dollars in gift cards and send it to some what felt like a legitimate or they're trying to position it as a legitimate business. Like, wait a minute. Like <laughs> You're actually going to the and it's like a three. What is it? Three billion dollar? Maybe I maybe I'm way off with that number, but like an insane industry for like the people getting gift cards. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I mean, there's a this doesn't really re relate to online fraud, but like there's a fraud thing with gas now where someone will go to the gas station, switch your uh, spout with the next station. You'll put your credit card in, and you think you're pumping your station, but the person on the other side is pumping their car up, and. Uh, you just kind of get confused there. And I mean, I, I think that's yep. probably a stupid way to do fraud because the, your license plate is on camera and all that's going on, but it's like desperate measures too. I mean, if someone wants to make money or get some money or try to save money, I guess they'll do whatever. My buddy just showed me that Instagram post with yeah. that, with the gas thing. And I go, and I'm like, I text him back. I'm like, what the hell's going on? And he goes like, Oh, the guy did the pump thing, you know? And I'm like, wouldn't he know? You know, I, yeah. I guess you don't look up to see where it's coming from. You, I guess you don't, you know, if you're going quick, you know, how many times you actually invest, you know, like, but now, now that it's out there, it's going to be like, okay, you know, it, he could have just been quiet and done it himself, but now he's got to publicize it. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, there's just always new things, but like going back to like the honey pots, like we'll see new trends, new like disposable domain addresses and just always picking up on new stuff. I mean, machine learning and all that stuff kind of comes into play as well, picking up on trends and uh, just kind of being vigilant ourselves, you know, like even though I'm the CEO, I'll still get on sales calls to kind of listen uh, and, and ask like, hey, what kind of fraud are you experiencing? And then our team will all share it between ourselves and be like, hey, you know, this is something new. We might need to look at it. So kind of just having this like culture where our team is open to talk about, you know, new fraud trends we've seen or heard from customers or, you know, whatever. So now the I'm curious to like the disposable email thing because like we all have gmails and yahoo accounts for our fantasy football and spam and you know what what connotates it being a garbage email address so there's a lot of like actual disposable companies out there so like every day they're coming out with a new domain so i mean we're looking at domain age when is the first time we've seen this email a lot of other you know data points we look at and based on that we can kind of tell you like hey this email you know probably isn't the the best to use and that kind of affects the fraud score that we give you you're asking i'm signing up right now so i could test my own email i just want i'm just curious as to uh yeah even our at ipqs i mean we 
we use our website as another like honeypot too. So we, we accept like all fraudulent signups. We'll block some stuff because what we found too is sometimes a legitimate person will block them. And if they call in that we know they're like a very interested client. So there's a lot right. of stuff that we do kind of tricky, but it's, it's our own honeypot. It's our own way of testing all of this stuff too. Yeah. It just, I, I would think this is almost like I always, you know, not saying that this is the stuff that, you know, I hate the, what keeps you up at night? You know what I mean? But like, you know, we always, we, we interview CISOs constantly mm-hmm. and it's like, how do you, you know, like legitimately, how do you sleep at night? Like just with stuff going on and you're, you're, you know, some of them are getting on the hook now for, for bigger cases of fraud or, or breaches. And it's just, it's almost, I don't want to say it's too much because it, it is, but it's literally, it's almost too much. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and where did you guys, you guys pulled my photo in? What in the world? I just signed up for a free account because <laughs> <laughs> I signed up for Gmail and it's not my Gmail picture. I wonder what that's weird. I'm going to, I'm going to have to talk to you offline on that one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So what else, uh, what else is going on with, uh, what's your plans for Weiss? Let's go back to, let's go back to talk about booze. Um, obviously you're making your own. Uh, I believe it's just whiskey and vodka, correct? Uh, there's more. So we got vodka, gin. Uh, we just launched our color changing absinthe that uses butterfly pea flower. So it starts off like this dark purple, almost like blue. Uh, and then when like citric acid or champagne or something that is a little acidic hits it, it turns pink. So it's the first ever color changing absinthe, 121 proof. Um, and then we also kill, have, you want to do you want to kill people? <laughs> I mean, our absinthe at first was 141, uh, but it was too smooth and too good, so we had to we had to take it down to 121. Um, but we also that's, have that's brandy nuts. coming, yeah, single malt coming. Uh, our bourbon is aging. We got about like seven more months on that. What, so. what kind of brandy? Uh, apple brandy. So an okay. apple jack. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm a. My I married a Polish girl, so uh, Jezinovka, the blackberry brandy, is a staple in our house. Nice. And uh, I'm full blooded. <laughs> What's that? Dobrzy dzień. Yeah, uh, yes, she would understand. I <laughs> all I know is shut up and beer in in Polish. <laughs> pivo. Um, yeah, pivo. Yeah. Dami pivo. Um, yeah. Uh, and I grew up in a German house, so you know, with us it was Berenjager, honey schnapps, and apple corn, and. <laughs> uh, the pear stuff from Yugoslavia, my grandpa always loved. So yeah, that was, I always liked, uh, I always had Shliva a fondness Vita? for Shliva. Yeah. That's the worst one. The pear was good. Yeah. Uh, Kruskovac, but Shliva is just, it's like <laughs> gasoline. I can't imagine that. Um, uh, it's probably like the 121 abs. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but we can, uh, so we can find you at IPQS at IPQS.com for the IP quality uh, score. Yep. And uh, Weiss Distillings, downtown Colossus, right on 14 in Maine. Yep. Um, Check out the website. It's the WDC.com. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cause, um, I, like I said, I think I've been there already five times. I was there with Randy once and then uh, w- with my wife a couple times. Um, but yeah, I always had a great, uh, great experience there. And I, uh, I wish you nothing but the best. Thanks so much. And then, um, Sabbath Coffee Roasters. What's the? How do you find you online? SabbathCoffeeRoasters.com. Well, that was easy. <laughs> so hey, we're gonna uh, wrap things up for this episode 441. I want to thank Dennis Weiss. Seriously, appreciate the time and the insight provided. Um, on behalf of uh, Bob and Randy, do us all a favor: drink up your drinks, get your phone numbers. You don't gotta go home. You just gotta get the hell out of here. See you next week. Drive careful. Beat it. <laughs>